the constant feeling of feeling dirty and having to clean myself six times a day at one point, wash myself with bleach, scrubbing myself till I have blisters. And that feeling still hasn't gone away. It began on Facebook. A woman, we're calling her Roxy, keen to have someone new in her life, answers a message to a man who ends up changing that life forever. Came across very charming, sent, like saying all these lovely things about me. I didn't really see any bad signs about him until he'd asked to come over Christmas Day. He was drinking heavily and said he wanted to have sex. It became clear he didn't want to take no for an answer and he sort of got angry with that. And he kept asking and asking, and I said no, and he started to throw things around the living room and like cushions, the remote, things like that. And he was stood up, standing above me, and quite aggressive and angry and shouting. And I'd asked him to leave, and he wouldn't leave. For three hours, she desperately tried to convince him to leave, as he became increasingly nasty raging and smearing dog feces all over the house before finally agreeing to go outside. So at that point I did, I called the police and he wouldn't leave the outside of my house. And obviously I was crying to them at this time. I was, you know, worried for my safety. I gave them all the information about him that I had. Even while on the phone to police, the man is repeatedly telling her the situation is her fault and she should drop it. Feeling under pressure, she phones the police back later and tells them not to come. But Roxy says she assumed they'd check his background, given everything she told them that day. After that night, the man changes tone, apologises and persuades her to give him a second chance. So despite the police inviting her to meet to discuss the incident, she turns them down and asks them to close the investigation, hoping everything will be fine. And I said, well, I've decided not to press charges because it's, it's done with now. And obviously at this point, that person got into my head saying to drop it, I'll get away with it. You know, and he'd made me feel that in a way it was my fault as to him reacting that way because I'd refused to have sex with him. So I felt it was my fault and I was silly for phoning them. But then he turns again after a party he demands sex. This time, the response goes beyond angry shouting. He put his hands on my throat, pushed down, was strangling me, to the point where I passed out and lost consciousness. And uh, I woke up to him slapping me around the face while he was still continuing to have intercourse with me. And I felt quite weak and I didn't know what was happening. Roxy went home shocked, confused and bruised. A friend she confided in told her, you know that's rape. The day after, he messaged to apologise, saying he was scared he'd gone too far. Then, on the 13th of February, 50 days after she first called to report the man to police, they arrive at her door. And they said, we're extremely worried about your safety. This person's dangerous. Have you had any further contact with him since Christmas Day? And I said, well, yes, this has happened. So obviously they reported it then. They took, you know, a statement from me. And again, they even said it to me. Yeah, that, that is rape, you know, and we are worried about your safety and we would like you to press charges. If they'd have come up to me with all that information after Christmas Day, he wouldn't have got back into my life like that. He wouldn't have manipulated the situation. And I think if they'd have told me, I wouldn't have been raped. We put this to South Yorkshire Police. They told us because of Roxy's initial call, they continued to investigate the circumstances around the incident on Boxing Day and made repeated attempts to speak to her, deciding to proactively trigger the domestic violence disclosure scheme so-called Claire's Law, when women are given information by police about a partner's potential risk. Once they've actioned Claire's Law, the police are required to disclose any information within 28 days. 
South Yorkshire Police said they followed all relevant procedures and did complete their disclosure to Roxy within the required timescale, which is set by the Home Office. They say that safeguarding Roxy was their priority. But Roxy is not the only one questioning whether something could have been done sooner. In general, you've got 28 days according to that guidance, but I know some forces are doing this within days. And on Claire's law specifically, it is not enough to say we've met the 28-day deadline if it's possible that there was information that could have been acted on earlier. Absolutely. There is better practice possible and forces should be actively understanding and learning from each other as to how for some forces, because I know they exist, are making these disclosures at much higher rates and within days. And that's exactly what victims need and deserve. Timing is of the essence. It's important to know as soon as possible why delay, um, why allow for administration to get in the way of safety. This person then started to stalk me. So it was love letters, little love gifts, you know, little soppy things, um, constant emails about how much he loved me and that he walked you know, past my house every day. I had fear because I was thinking he was watching me all the time. He then found out where I was working, um, turning up there. And they said, oh, we're going to arrest him today for stalking. But they never did. South Yorkshire Police told us a man has been interviewed in connection with Roxy's allegations. It said Roxy remains our priority as the investigation progresses. It said the police inspectorate judged the force outstanding at protecting vulnerable people and it remained committed to continuously improving its work. So from the police disclosure coming too late, no offer of protection when she was stalked, and now the long wait to hear whether he's charged, and even if he is, an even longer wait for a court date. Roxy says she feels let down at every turn. How hopeful are you of getting that justice? At this moment in time, not, not very hopeful. Obviously with the interaction I've had with the police so far, um, I've sort of lost my faith in the justice system. Realistically, when you need their help, they're not there. A Home Office spokesperson told us information should be released at the earliest possible opportunity that does not put a potential victim at risk and we're working with police to improve the scheme's implementation. Well, I've been speaking to Assistant Commissioner Louisa Rolfe, the National Police Chief's Council lead for domestic abuse. I put to her Roxy's assertion that if police had warned her sooner about the danger this man posed, she might not have been raped. the domestic violence disclosure scheme, Claire's Law, a really good opportunity for us to share information proactively with victims. We know that at the moment not every force has applied that in the same way. So the very fact that she feels it wasn't, that information wasn't passed on as quickly as she believes it might have been, and the fact that that left her exposed to terrible danger in the end. It makes me feel incredibly sad because if we hold information that can ensure, if we share it proactively, people are safer, then we must do that. To be fair to South Yorkshire Police, they, they were proactive about it. Um, they say that they've done everything by the book and they've disclosed within the time frame of the guidance. And the Domestic Abuse Commissioner says it's not enough to say, we've done it by the book, we've met the deadline. I agree. It, it's about, it's not just about meeting the deadline, it's about ensuring safety of victims where we can. And we know we don't have a perfect system and we're working really hard with forces to understand best practice with the victim commissioner's office to understand what more can we do to improve this we've been looking at the use of restraining orders in domestic abuse and how women tell us their abusers again and again breach these orders and nothing is done about it so we've been working really hard with forces nationally around how we use protective orders, how we ensure that those orders are recorded on police systems nationally so that every force can access them. So perpetrators can't escape justice by travelling around the country. Which they are doing at the moment. And we know that we must work harder on this, but also we've got to ensure that we work with victims to protect them effectively and with partners in the justice system. We followed one woman to court whose partner had breached 
a restraining order or five times and he was finally taken to court and sent to jail for a matter of weeks for that specific offence. Now she has no trust in the system. We also know that it emboldens perpetrators, don't we? So this is really critical to get right. I agree. It's really important that our justice system as a whole, but why not is just it still failing on this? I, I'm working really hard with partners in CPS and others to say, you know, where we apply a restraining order, where we apply for a protective order, any breach of that must be taken seriously. We don't expect officers to have to wait for a third or fourth or horrifyingly a fifth breach of a, a protective order because when we apply for those orders, we see them as really important to protect a victim. The police constantly talk now about how domestic abuse is to be viewed as on a par with terrorism. Charities on the ground, we've been working with a small charity really on the sharp end called Resolute in South Yorkshire. They say this is just lip service. We know there are more than two million victims of domestic abuse every year in the, in the UK. If we had more than two million victims of terrorist offences, the, the response would be very different, I suggest. So we are working on how do we ensure that we understand the threat of domestic abuse? How do we work with partners to ensure that our policing response, our prosecuting response, ensures that we take those cases very, very seriously. We know how many women die at the hands of a partner or ex-partner every week in the UK. We know the prevalence of suicide by victims of domestic abuse is horrifying too, and we've been working to understand how we might respond effectively to that. The campaigners, the people working on the ground with women who are suffering domestic abuse, domestic violence now, they do not believe it when you say this is a priority. But charge and conviction rates are, are, are tiny. Yes. And, and that is an better. indictment, isn't it, of policing. It's an indictment of the criminal justice system. It's letting huge numbers of victims down. It's also a sign of how complex these cases are to secure justice. We've invested in greater capability to deal with digital evidence, you know, more forensic capability nationally in policing. We also know that very many victims do not seek a justice solution. And this is not a problem we can arrest away or prosecute our way out of. I, I worry sometimes if, if we focus on the sole solution to this being about prosecuting perpetrators, when we know the reality of where we get it right, sentences are not long, hefty sentences that make the problem disappear forever with domestic abuse. Should they be? I absolutely see cases where I want to, you know, I want us to lock people up and throw away the key. But I also know that many victims want the abuse to stop and we need to work really effectively on what good prevention looks like. You have this joint justice plan coming. What will be your message to officers in your plan so that every single officer takes this as seriously as you want them to? Often those officers first responding to an incident will be, you know, they they might have just come from a, a robbery, a burglary, a collision, you know, they might have been involved in a, a fast time threat, high threat incident and the next minute they're at a domestic abuse incident and we want them to show empathy, compassion, professional curiosity. We want them to be really inquisitive about what has happened here. How will you measure the success of your joint justice plan? I want to see more perpetrators held to account and I want to see victims safer. Louisa Rolf, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. And if you need any support after that discussion, you can find more information and links at channel4.com support.